We're very glad to be with everybody tonight. James uh, had some problems with work and asked me to fill in for him, so here I am. I won't be speaking too long tonight, but I noticed that they moved the Battleship Texas to where they can work on it. It was quite a sight to see it going up the coast. If you didn't know any better and from at least the news film, you would, you would think it's doing it on its own. But of course, it's a memorial. There are so many memorials, the Alamo for Texas. You have all kinds of monuments, all sorts of things to help us remember. I think of one of the greatest probably is as far as size and long as it's been around is in Egypt outside of Cairo at uh, Giza where you have the Great Pyramids and you have the one that's called the Great Pyramid and it is a monument, a memorial and it's been thought up until archaeologists in recent years that it was from Pharaoh Khufu. I hear recently in the reading that they're not quite sure that's the case or not, but nevertheless, whoever built the thing intended it to be a monument to him to remind you of whoever built it. The base of that pyramid is 13 acres, and it's estimated to contain two to 2.8 million blocks of stone, <clears throat> each weighing from two to 15 tons, and supposedly around 100,000 slaves spent 20 years in constructing the thing so that somebody could be remembered. When we visited over there many, many years ago, it was awful hot the day we were there and we'd ridden camels up there. But we decided, a few of us, we'd try to scale at least some of it. But it was too much of trouble to go very far up, so I didn't do that. Well, at least I went part way up, but not by any means all the way up. Well, you even remember something like that. Not for the reason he wanted to be remembered, but you remember it. So we have all kinds, sizes of memorials. But now think of this, how unlike the memorial Jesus instituted for his death. Most memorials just simply are not uh, anything like that. Instead of being located in a, some far off place that most people will never personally experience, the Lord's Supper is always near. In, instead of requiring uh, tons of stone that time wears out with the roads, and no matter how hard the stone. The memorial to our Lord's death requires simply unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. Now, one thing about that memorial is that the people who appreciate it as God intended are those who are genuinely converted to Christ and they're God's children and all that that implies. They understand what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made to save us from our sins. It becomes a very personal memorial. So instead of uh, thousands of men laboring many, many years to build, it is commemorated by multitudes of Christians all over the world each Lord's Day, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. 
It's interesting how God does things. Something as simple as that. Fruit of the vine and unleavened bread. Yet it brings to mind the greatest act of love on the part of mankind, anything, any, any act could ever be. Jesus dying for our sins. And in observing the Lord's Supper, Christians are to remember our Lord as he did sacrifice himself on the cross. And Paul reminded, even in writing part of the New Testament, the Corinthians of that in 1 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> 23 through 26, and other places, of course, the scriptures. We read that many times before the Lord's Supper, where we observe it in the worship assembly on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. We think of his great love, which we never can fathom. We think of his sacrifice, and a sacrifice means you always give up something very precious, near and dear to you. And we think that he did all of that because the scripture teaches us in order that our sins could be forgiven. Read Isaiah 53 connected with it, and we see with his stripes we are healed. We commune not only with him, that is, with Christ, but we commune with our brothers and sisters in Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. We all have the same Savior. There is but one. And that Savior suffered and died for the salvation of everyone. For those who've heard the gospel and from the heart believed and obeyed it, Romans 6, 3 and 4 and 17 and 18. It is a very special act. Now, I'm speaking only of one act of worship in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. Any other act ought to have our attention, and we ought to know the purpose of it. So your mind must be right, and it must be educated. We're reminded of what is truly important when we think of Christ saying, not my will, but thine be done, such as, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep his commandments. That's what Jesus did, Ecclesiastes 12. In fact, we often will say, let's put away from our minds the disagreements and the various mundane things of this present world and various distractions and egos and whatever there may be, worldly enticements, set them all aside and draw as near as we can to show him forth the death of Christ until he come when we observe the Lord's Supper. So think about how simple it is, and yet it draws from the babe in Christ to the most experienced faithful Christian all that their individual faith can supply. Every thought's on Jesus Christ. Every thought is on his sacrifice for our sin. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we meet in sweet communion, as we often sing, on this coming Lord's Day. And any of them, the Lord might see fit for us to add to that. Then we need to have the knowledge of God's word forefront in our mind that allows the mind's eye to go back to that horrible, shameful scene of Golgotha. Matthew 27 and John 19. For the purest and blessed of all that ever walked this earth died on that cross for our sin. That's not just an emotional thing. It certainly does key the emotions. And if it does, there's something wrong with a person. But none of this will make any difference if you're not taught right about it. If you're not thinking about what the Bible says about it. We certainly cannot truly visit the cross each week as we're speaking here now. 
and remain a haughty, puffed up, prideful, and hateful bunch. He is the lamb who was dumb before his shears and opened not his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. So remember the one who loved you, loved me, and gave himself for us because we are expected, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to yield our bodies living sacrifices unto him, which is our reasonable service. We need to remember the one who shed his blood for the cleansing of our sins, Ephesians 1, 7. As we studied that long ago in Hebrews 9, 14. There's so many other passages. How that we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 1, 5. We need to remember the kind of crown that he wore on that day. We need to remember the cruel scourging, mocking, taunting that was done. How the mob jeered him, gave him no mercy. Those who should have recognized him to be the Messiah were those that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. He suffered from that terrible crowd, and he willingly did so, and he did it out of love for them as well as us. So I'll just close here and say, as the beautiful sacred song tells us, when we come into worship and engage in the other four acts of worship, our minds upon them as they ought to be, having been instructed according to the truth regarding them, then we will certainly, when we come to this that shows forth the Lord's death till he come, we can sing the song, and you may remember it. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, do this in my memory. Thank you.